Mary. Howdy. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, loud and clear. Sam, can you hear me? I can now respond. Interesting. I'm not hearing anything. Maybe yeah. I should change my headset. Okay, go to the bottom left hand corner audio setting, click the up arrow key and see okay. if it's connected. I can hear it. I can hear now. I can hear now. Hey, Stace. Uh, All Stacey's right. Unmute, Stacy. Hello, I'm going to turn my camera on just for two minutes while I finish my breakfast. Okay, go for it. Go right. it. No, you need to share. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. I know, working on that. Yep. Sam, Thank where you. do you live? San Jose. If you if you know the Apple spaceship headquarters, I'm literally walking distance from it. It's wow. five minutes, wow. like I would say three two minute drive on the highway. Wow. Yeah. So whenever they shoot a, a nuclear bomb over, I'll be the first one to get it. I'll let you know. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's some expensive real estate to be living in. I know. Tell me about it, right? <laughs> I just did. <laughs> yeah. I came here first. They, they, they joined me later, so that's not my problem. <laughs> yeah. I came here back in 84. Bought the house in, I think, 1990. Yeah, so. <clears throat> I almost ended up in Boston. <laughs> oh, well. so I graduated from Ohio State in 84, right? So I have a friend from high school that's in Boston. I was going to join him over there and all that stuff. I said, no, I can't. You cannot come because... I'm living with my uncle. I only have a one bedroom, so I can't do it. So okay, fine. <laughs> then I end up in San Francisco instead. Yeah. Well, talk about breakfast. I just had breakfast yesterday with my daughter <laughs> up in Bellingham. And it was the second or third time in my life I had a frittata. I saw a frittata on the breakfast menu. Hmm. And I have to say, there's quite a wide range of interpretation of frittata recipes. So this is unlike any other frittata I'd ever had before. Hmm. Curious. By the way, Sam, your audio no good. My no, it is. sounds like you're sounds like you're gargling. We can we can understand you. It just sounds like there's a bit okay. of a let me change. Okay, testing, testing. How's this? Yeah, much better. better. Yeah, at least. It, but first. the volume is low. The yeah, quality is better, but the volume is low. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go back testing, to automatic testing. game. How's this? Yeah. Oh, in increase the microphone's amplifications. Yeah. I just have to sit closer, I guess. Yeah. That's automatic. another way of doing it. <laughs> You're going to be doing this. Automatic gain is <laughs> salvation. Ooh. Whoa. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> A 3D effect, right? My microphone is right here, right over there. Yeah. Okay. Got it. It's this. Uh, it could be on your neck. That'd be good. Oh, the snowball. Yeah, have a snowball. The snowball is omnidirectional. You mean something like this? Yeah. See, I have the one that's. That's um, a snowflake. I have one of those too. Except I lost it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can get this to reach, but I have the highly directional one that you got to point right at your lips. Yeah. I have a loud voice. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> I okay, didn't know I'm somebody treated my headset. <laughs> the headset was a problem. Yeah. That was an experiment. So it turns out that the snow snowball and the Logitech camera mm. and uh, the Logitech speakers are, are much better. Yeah. And this I'm is using Microsoft headset too. Yeah. I'm using Microsoft, but we can wish it. Surface Studio. It has to do with my compare what you have. This is a birthday present. Is this anything like what you got? Gaming headset. No. 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 I haven't tried it. I haven't unpacked it yet. <laughs> I have right. to unpack that headset and see uh, what it does. I haven't tried it yet. If you want to see something new, this is the newest one. The Microsoft Surface. Yeah. Okay. Here, but 
because I don't have any housemates, I don't have to worry about having the, the loudspeakers on here in the computer room. I don't figure that if I don't need any Bluetooth, extra Bluetooth in my in my ear. So I play with it, but it's not something I'm gonna wear it all day long. I, I keep worrying about losing those things and them falling out of my ears and they're very expensive. Yeah. The, 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 the nice thing about being a reseller is you can buy this thing like $20. <laughs> off reset version. All right, Sam. If I could buy a set from you, I'll do it. Yeah, let me know. <laughs> All right. Any anybody want to check in? I have a uh, a story to recount, but I'll do it after everybody checks in. I'm all good. I was just checking in with the chat GDP, but it's too busy right now to do any checking. <laughs> you have to do it at two o'clock in the morning Pacific time when everybody else on the planet is asleep. I was waiting for the one that if you pay me ten dollars, I will let you give me a priority that you know yeah. give you the half the bandwidth or something. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I appreciate those transcripts that you pasted in where you had asked Chat GPT, what did you learn today, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking for so I'm looking for the boundary where I call the knowledge, you know, the edge of the knowing, you know, where, where can I push it? Where can I trust it? Where can I not trust it? How do I know? I mean, you know, and I know collecting the data is like, you're only as good as the data you collected until I know where, where's your edge of your data collection schema or whatever. Normally, if you had done a, a literature uh, survey to see the frontiers on some topic and you notice that there are, um, competing perspectives and, and maybe internal inconsistencies. Um, if you raise those to the attention of chat GPT, it will acknowledge that portions of its summary are at odds with other portions, but it has no ability to resolve the discrepancy and figure out you know, what, you know, where the ground truth is. It, it, it admits that it doesn't, it, it doesn't do the next bit of, of, of um, research to, to sort it all out. Just reports what it what it finds. It's no different than a human being. I mean, you know, the way I think about human being is like a black box. This is what I tell my people: it's like your kids, like a black box. You have to ask probing question to yeah. see where the you know where they miss something, where they got it, where they master, where they are just amateur learning how to do something. So, but, but with a human, if you're in a really good dialogue of the sort, for example, that Socrates pioneered. You can lead them to the edge of the frontier where they can go aha and find the next piece that goes into the frontier, the jigsaw puzzle that enlarges the knowledge base and is consistent and makes predictions that can be tested and found to be valid. And ChatGPT isn't there yet. Most people aren't either. Most people yeah. don't do contributions of knowledge. They will form hypotheses haphazardly and not bother to test them, simply assert them and, and act as if they're the ground truth. And, that's one of the main problems of, of politics and, and other features of our culture is that people will act on beliefs that have not been tested, just been yep. haphazardly adopted. What I found is that if I have met someone that's the same, almost the same level on a specific topic as me as the same level, usually when, the, as soon as I found out they're on the same level, I be able to go up one level without even noticing it. And just like, it's like, I logically or, I don't psychologically take the next step, go up to the next level. That I can, I can be at a meta level and look down and say, oh, I see. Thank you for bringing me here. Exactly. Think, go ahead, Stacey. I was, do you think, Sam, that's in part because you also have, because I know you're a very self-aware person and you check yourself. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's because you feel that you have the support of another intelligent person that you could take a bigger leap because if you go too far, you'll be put back into check. Great question. It's not that I think they got to support. It's almost like I'm walking in the cloud. Imagine that. And I'm walking for the test to us something or whatever, like just for fun or whatever. And I notice that somebody is shoulder to shoulder with me. Not that they support me. I support them. We are just talking. And then the frequency just in sync is sort of like vibration. There's like we're in the same vibration or we are in the same sync. And it's the same thing. It's like I feel so comfortable that I'm with this person. And they validate me and I validate them. And once I'm in my handshake signal thing, then it's like, oh, got it. No, I've, now I know that I got shoulder shoulder on the same step with someone. I'm very comfortably or naturally moved to the next level. If I catch myself a lot on that, like, 
especially in the lecture, like last week, we, I have a lecture with from somebody from India, talk about enlightenment. Like I, I've been studying enlightenment since I was 14 years old, you know, so like, and what she's saying all the time, I, I catch what she missed. It's not that I'm smarter than her. I catch, even though she had millions of, you know, disciples and followers, I catch what she missed. I see where she can improve. At the same time, also, wow, it allowed me, I, I get the most part of talking about this. I, I'm noticing that I can get up to the next level. It's like, wow, nice. I can breathe now. <laughs> One of the things I wrote about today is I was looking for a word that may or may not exist in the English language, or it may exist in maybe Hindu or something. If, some, if you can bring somebody or even yourself to the verge of an insight or moment of enlightenment, is there a word that says, uh, that refers to being on the verge of making um, a next step that is going to be a moment of insight or enlightenment? Is there a word for that state? Uh, it don't have a word for the state, but it's a word for, uh, let me explain to you. I'm sure you know about Buddhism is that Bodhisattva is someone like getting a PhD, but refuse to be a professor yet. Yeah. Bodhisattva. When you're Buddha, you're the professor. When you are, you know, you're, you know, when you're Bodhisattva, you are right. one. Yeah, I know Bodhisattva. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah. one step before. So you, you it's shine the path of on the next step, which you yourself haven't taken. Yeah, I mean, you, all you need to do is turn in the paper and you got yourself a professorship, right? Yeah, so, yeah. but you're holding on to the paper. So, I would we say the a... Buddhist, Bodhisattva ship mental state, it will be the yeah. one that you're just describing. We need to find a word for that uh, state being on the threshold um, hmm. where there's just one step that you can illuminate, even though you yourself haven't taken it. Yeah. Could be dangerous. You go first. <laughs> well, somebody got to go first, whether you like it or not. A lot of times, that's what I say about falling in love. It's like you're falling in love. You're falling into enlightenment. Whether you like it or not, you're there. <laughs> like, oops, light is on. Yeah. As I'm thinking about, so it's like when you lead the match, you're, you're rubbing the two, you know, what they call that, the rough surface and the combustible mm -hmm. material, and the light will just sparkle yeah. and it. it have a gain energy and then you get the oxygen and the light comes and then suddenly the lights up I, the way that i think about it is I, I see things so clearly now i'm no longer struggling it's no longer a matter of making decision i mean the decision is already made for me it's hard to know if you're on the verge of falling in love or on the verge of falling into a trap oh, one you have no idea that's why i call it a big blind spot <laughs> exactly <laughs> You haven't taken the step and you don't know for sure if it's going to be ecstasy or uh, hellish. Right. I want to come back to Tracy. Tracy, did I answer your question a little bit? Oh, I'm not yes, sure. and it's, it's, for me, it was the same thing as what I was saying. It might have been different words, but yeah. You got it. Okay, so I'll make sure you got it covered. So. Yes, thank you. So it is important to me because unless you're clear on something for me, I cannot move forward. I get stuck with it. No, no, no. And, and, you know, just to add another word, there's certainly certainly a synergy that happens when you connect with that other person. Yes, to me, synergy is a, like a more business terminology. You co-create something that's bigger than what one of you can individually can create. Imagine there's a creator other than yourself and then okay. think of the word synergy. Okay, the synergy with the, the okay, <laughs> the big one. <laughs> right, exactly. The co-creator or the co-pilot, helping you navigate, but not actually. Love it, love it. <laughs> you know, a lot of times I was too shy to talk about enlightenment because it's such a subject that people have don't no understand what talking about. It's like it's like PhD student talking to a kindergarten or something. Like it's, it's so hard, right. and I'm very grateful that I can freely and comfortably be able to discuss with you guys in the terminology it really means a lot to me just want to let you know that thank you so much this is one of the reasons i think that we invent stories whether they're fables or parodies or allegories or parables or whatever the the stories are supposed to bring somebody to a moment of enlightenment even though the story itself is synthetic and mm. part of the problem is that even though the story was synthetic and therefore constructive in terms of promoting an increment of, of insight mm. people complain that it's not that story is a lie therefore mm. i shouldn't i shouldn't uh, find any value in it and i think that's a mistake that people make they say synthetic stories are lies therefore you should throw them away mm. 
And Aesop's fables are valuable, even though obviously they're synthetic stories. Mm. There aren't any talking animals that are telling, you know, moral uh, uh, insights. Mm. I do, I want to, the, the two points I want to talk about, what you just say, synthetic story. One is that with my child, I don't read them story from, you know, Disney World, Disneyland, you know, Disney. Mm. I, 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 I create story, co-create story with them. I usually let them finish the last word or last two words. Right. And yeah. let them, you know, that, that's how I find out what's in their head. And that's right. also find out whether they got it right or got it wrong. So that's what that's the synthetic. The other one you talk about enlightenment is like, I call that empowerment. It's just, I always catch myself, I want to give the answer to my students or participants. I rather cook, you know, you know synthet, synthesize a lot of stories and then get bring them to the verge and let them discover it. Because when they light the fire, when they turn on the light, when they see what needs to be seen, they got into the version and they jump into the next one, the leap of faith or whatever you call that. It's, it's, you can then walk away. They got it. It's like, you know, like you say, I never thought of it like synthetic story and the version of enlightenment. Yeah, that's right. a beautiful description. It's very nice, concise. Zen koans are synthetic stories. Yeah, lots and of they, them. And, and they are designed to uh, promote a moment of enlightenment. Yeah read so many of thousands of them and yeah. so many times again and again and again. And the trouble I have right now is that I, I have a different level of it again to big trouble. So for example, one, one just only one of my favorite one is uh, a thief going to a monk's uh, living area. And this monk is so poor, they had nothing in it. So the thief come out empty handed and the monk come home and saw him. It so looked like, and he the monk take off his own shirt and give it to him on his shoulder. Yeah, so this is a story that very famous one. Like, and from my perspective, I got multiple versions out of it. One would be the less you have, the less you need to protect. So he never locked his door. Right? But if you have a lot of things in there, you want to lock your door or something along that line. Yeah. And the other thing is that when you see someone don't have something, you know, it's a compassion for you to give them what you have, regardless of what will happen to you. Because when you when you go into the compassion mode. You don't really think about yourself anymore. You lost yourself because you are in a second position, right? Again, I can go on and on and on and tell you multiple versions of it, right? So I tweak my story. This is where I see that this story come in. I'll do whatever needed, you know. But I'm talking about, say, see, I remember they talk about the, the young lady that wanted to quick kill herself. You, you give me some advice about what happened and all that, the, the story and all that stuff. Anyway, by the way, it resolved now. She's now get out of that. Stunt, I call it stunt mode. And so thank you so much for give me a story I can tell. I give me an ingredient that I can create synthetic story so I can work it work for her. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. yeah so ingredient is important for me. To, the synthetic story need this, I call it like key story and how do we call it? So I can add one more element into it that like the, the monk lose, you know, don't have anything in the in the house and give the shit is that kind of thing i guess like compassion in it have don't have disappointment and you know the person that coming to the house must be desperate because they, they, they nobody want to steal anything until they don't have a choice and you know and unless you that's just why i keep saying that as soon as you have a judgment or something you have a blind spot about somebody and unless the judgment go away you are not really in the second position i you i call that you're not one with the person that you're you know, having a judgment with, if that makes sense. So this has to do with my check-in because, well, okay, a couple of things have been on my mind. One is I was coming here saying, did we ever, have we diagnosed the problem? <laughs> which, which <laughs> that was problem? For, <laughs> which, which the problem for of, so why has humanity kept screwing up? Oh, have okay. we diagnosed that problem? Because I've heard many times that the first step is to diagnose the problem, and I'm not hearing any diagnosis. But the second thing that I want to, so an observation I want to make is this lack of curiosity. And so, for example, I was looking at a conversation, it was on a Facebook group, and somebody said, this is what happened, what are your thoughts? And all these people are coming on with these thoughts, and I'm like, wait a minute. They haven't asked one question about the story, like not one question about who these people are, what's their relationship to each other. 
And so now let me draw the where this goes to the you know Barry stories and Sam stories. The ingredient that Sam has injected with his kids, it's that interactive part of it. Because traditionally, I think a story has been told and we've been expected to follow the story. And we've been told about all the things in the story that haven't really been specified, but some power has decided this is what it means and this is how you have to take it. And until we can learn to really allow for some movement, we're not going to move further because like Sam, when you were mentioning that you were listening to this woman talking about enlightenment and there were some things that, you know, you disagreed with, but other things that really like moved you to places. In my mind, you were getting different pieces that you needed that may be very different for what other people in the audience were getting that they needed. And we need to allow for that individuality. And I think that's part of where we have an issue. That's when, when, if we ever diagnose the problem, some of that is gonna come into play. And then we can think about, well, how do we make that not happen? How do we do better? <laughs> And that's my check-in, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I concur with the, the notion of identifying with as much precision as possible the frontier. Where is the edge of the cliff? How far can we walk up to the edge and be on solid ground? And what's the next step that's going to be off the edge of the cliff? And finding the exact frontier between solid knowledge and speculation or misconceptions or gaps, that really is a useful uh, outcome of, of uh, investigation. And at least for me, the Socratic method is one of the best mechanisms for finding the frontier, but it's probably not the only one. And, and maybe, maybe what I'm missing are other ways to find the location of the frontier. The last piece of reliable information that I can stand on and the next piece where I don't know if I'm gonna fall into a trap or fall into love. Mm. Yeah. Sam, home. <laughs> Sam looks Sam, very pensive. I, he's processing his diagnosis. I'm, I'm jumping in. <laughs> I'm jumping in to create a space because I want to hear your thoughts. I don't think he's finished them yet. He looks like he's still constructing them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 yeah, let's. Uh, uh, yeah. You look very pensive, Sam, like yeah. you were in the process of constructing something, but you hadn't put it into a coherent sentence yet. I have two coherent sentences, possibly three. Okay? <laughs> and that is, in a flow such as the three of you are engaged in, I think slower. And so I'm wary of disrupting the flow, which has a certain rhythm to it, but that if I'm actually going to express the questions I have, it kind of slows us down. So I'm wondering whether or not that changes the energy somewhat. So that's why I was considering whether or not to say something. Yeah, that I was agree. the meta thought. Yeah, um, a lot of people talk faster than I can listen. And I think slower than people want me to think because they want faster answers. And, and this business of how much time should you spend thinking before speaking so that what you speak is coherent, clear, and digestible by the listener. I just want to address Sam's first comment. I think in this case, we needed to slow down. I mean, it would be nice if we actually had silence for a minute so that everybody could like catch up. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I did jump in and ask you your thoughts. Yeah. Okay. I sometimes want a written transcript so that I can diagram the bloody sentences <laughs> and figure out what's being said. Spoken uh, sentences often I can't diagram in real time. So I'm getting bits of the words, but I'm not getting the, the semantic content of the message. I'm getting an unassembled jigsaw puzzle of word pieces, word, you know, sentence fragments. What was your second coherent sentence that you said you had? Okay, so on this point about whether we're on the edge of a cliff. I think that 
again, potentially reveals blind spots. Yes. See, it's easy to look at a physical cliff and say, okay, I should not really come within six inches of that edge, okay? Because down there, that's a fall of about a thousand feet, okay? Right. But attendant to that same approach, if we've gotten to, let's say, 10,000 square feet, we're on a different edge. I'm on a different edge of where I may not be getting enough oxygen. And yet that may not be conscious. I may not be aware of that. So we can see certain boundaries. We can see certain cliffs, but we possibly are very blind to other cliffs. Yes. Yeah. And yet at any moment, it's a multi-dimensional problem. Yes. Yeah. It could be food that I'm lacking. It could be rope that I'm lacking. It could be the cliff that I'm approaching. It could be oxygen that I'm missing. You know, it could be all of these. It could be, you know, the fact that my brain's already numbed because it's only got 45% of the oxygen it normally gets. That's a different cliff. Yep. Okay? Yep. So I think that this notion of cliffs is an interesting one because it goes back to another thought I had, and it's something I've been discussing for about 10 or 11 years with various people, but it's the core, one of the core ideas of the COI, the Community of Impact, and that is there are many well-meaning people on this planet, many, and they see a problem and they say, okay, I'm going to go help solve that problem. So if you got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of such well-meaning people, each working at these things, number one, do they know about each other? Are they working at cross purposes? Are they doing redundant effort? So I'm wondering whether or not there's some coordinated thing which allows us to think more systemically that kind of lifts us up a little bit above the I'm a little hummingbird just you know dropping my one little drop on the rainforest that's on fire, okay? And yet you cannot fault, I cannot fault the hummingbirds. It is not the fault of the hummingbird to say, I wanna go do something right now. I'm not gonna wait for any other hummingbird. And yet, if you get enough hummingbirds thinking this way, you can sort of see that, hey, that's an opportunity to level up, to coordinate to understand where the efforts are at cross purposes. Maybe 10,000 are over here working on this one little acre, and maybe, you know, there's uh, 500 other acres over there that are not being addressed at all of the fire. Yeah. So these are questions that are, in my mind, sometimes useless to ask because the common wisdom is just be a hummingbird. And so when you ask, when I ask these questions, it's potentially like uh, anti-common wisdom. And that's the question I have is whether or not we want to have that conversation. Because the COI is all about saying, can we level up from individual efforts to actually think more systemically as a society? And heretofore, we have proven that we cannot. So we have to show that we can, and we've not proven that we can yet. Over. I would just go back to my original statement and say, <clears throat> if we haven't first diagnosed the problem, why would we want to start something new? Because everybody diagnoses the problem, everybody comes up with a solution because they're action-oriented. So, so if I were just to ask you, I'll ask everybody, in two sentences, what do you think is the problem why hasn't humanity gotten it right in like two sentences okay i've got my two sentences because we've allowed people who disrespect truth to survive and to disrespect the people who do respect truth and this is actually a post i wanted to bring up i had posted it this earlier this week that right now the people who can help society, who are thinking at the boundary, who are thinking systemically, who are creating complex models, who are looking at limits to infinity, et cetera, et cetera, are being shoved aside in society. Their solutions are not being given any attention, any focus, because the masses who decide the course of society by voting 
don't understand what the people at the apex of society are doing or trying to pursue. And so we get entertainment shoved down our throats. We get simple solutions like 15 versus 725. We get very simple, dumb solutions that will never, never extrapolate correctly. All right. Unsustainable. So way more than two sentences. Those are two. Okay, maybe three sentences. That's it. I'll stop this. Long sentences. <laughs> With a lot of commas in between and semicolons. Yes. 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 So Does stop. anybody else have two sentences? Uh, I, I do, but before I do the two sentences, I want to go back to uh, Sam's visual uh, metaphor of the hummingbirds. The metaphor that I would propose is not hummingbirds in flight over a burning forest, but people in a rowboat with oars. And if I'm rowing in this direction, thinking that's the right direction to go, and the other guy's rowing in that direction, because he's independently thinking that's the other direction, then we're not coordinated and we're going to go around in circles. And that visual metaphor works better for me as to the notion of can we all be coordinated so that we agree on the direction to row and we're rowing unison and not at cross purposes. So, so, so that, that, that's my proposed visual metaphor there. Um, the, the two sentences are humans are prone to making blunders, misdiagnosing, uh, mis acting in a way which they think is going to help solve the problem, but in fact is going <laughs> to, you know, end up being a dysfunctional solution. So recognizing, analyzing, and diagnosing blunders, and that's the name of the problem, blundering, and then how to minimize the likelihood of continuing to blunder as we attempt to address the blunders we've already made historically. Anybody else with two sentences? <laughs> I could go, yeah, I guess. Uh, for me, it's uh, the law of karma, cause and effect, is a given. So we have to respect that. And then and the next thing I will say, this next sentence is, the little boy that walk on the beach, that see thousands and thousands of starfish on the beach and pick out the one and throw that back into the ocean, say, well, I make a difference on this one here. And where's the problem? The universe didn't have a thousand hands boy, <laughs> nor have a bulldozer, you know, that can do it electronically or whatever remotely and that pick up 10,000 starfish and throw in the back of the ocean. So we do what we can. We are respecting the law of karma where when you throw the starfish, the starfish may not want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, you know, they sit back the next day, say yell at you, you know, whatever you want to call it. So it's, I hate to say this, but to me, the level I'm at right now, I'm just saying that if you have someone in a better position, it's for you, it's not for them. When you solve a problem, you may not solve it for them, you may be solving for yourself. So be, be careful what you're helping people with and be mindful about what they really want then listen to them more carefully and be more interactive in terms of helping instead of just help because you think they need help i'm complete so without judgment my diagnosis is along those lines my diagnosis is that human beings tend to put their put Human beings tend to act in ways that benefit themselves above community, not recognizing that they are attached to their community and a part of it and a pe and actually, I mean, that we're all connected, that it, we are actually a part of everything. And Sam, Sam Han, I wanna go back to what you said because you started, you said, we have allowed. And the first thing I did is I said, I have allowed. Now that that didn't fit for me. <laughs> I'm going to let Sam Chan finish what I started because this is something difficult for me. I could I was only able to go as far as I did because I'm so comfortable here. There are other spaces where I wouldn't even do that. 
Thank you. I find out okay. that yeah. I have to do the same there's, way. There's tolerate and there's allow. <laughs> tolerate is you you cope with it as best you can, even though you wish it wouldn't happen. And allowing is sort of saying, oh, it's okay with me. Yeah, that's not, not okay really with... the point. Yeah. That's not really the point, though, that I want to go no. back to. I don't know which Sam wants to go first. <laughs> I can go again. Uh, I wrote down some notes before I catch. We go further on that. When you say about cliff, my vision of cliff is one inch cliff, maybe one foot if you get the bruise out of it. And the 10,000 feet cliff happened once in a big while, but usually it's a one inch cliff. You know, that's one thing. The other thing about it is that because of my contamination from the Buddhist teaching since I was very young, uh, I believe in all sentient beings have Buddhahood. So which means that every one of them comes with good intention. The, the intention may not be good for you, but it's definitely good for them. Trust me. And I tested that many, many times and it's always good for them. You know, no matter how bad it is, even with Hitler, you know, it's always good for him. Uh, that kind of, uh, so if you use that information that I just mentioned, how can I, like Barry Stowell, how do I synthesize the future instead of synthesize the story? Yeah. Yeah. I'm I wanted to actually hook it up uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this. Because when I had posted my post, um, you had responded in a curious way. So let me, as a precursor okay. to this, let me read my post verbatim, okay. Okay? okay? The post reads as follows. To allow large populations of our planet to live without the due respect and appreciation for truth, and for that many to disregard the gift of eons of evolutionary development that is our frontal cortex, and yet allow them influence and in deciding the course of our communities and nations is a disaster. That was my verbatim quote. And you, if I recall correctly, Stacy, had responded with, you can't force anyone to do something, or, or words to that effect, right? And what I find curious is that my use of the word allow got you an immediate association with the word force or some sort of, you know, coercion, which does not, is not necessary. I, I, I'm i going to push back on that. I think language is very indicative. Ah, but to allow does not mean that you have to use force to prevent. Not stand in the way. That's right. Okay, but I'm from the point of view of verbalizing, we have allowed. Yes, we have allowed. We didn't stand in the way. We didn't push That's back. Right. That's right. Well, number one, who is we? Let's Sorry. start there. We. Humanity. Who's we? We, humanity. This is a way big topic. Yes. But yes, just, <laughs> yes but, but just to be clear, I pushed back on the word allow because to me, using the word allow is already putting us in a mindset of, allow, of going back to what you, what, how you diagnose the problem. And I, I actually see that kind of thinking as a big part of the problem. So that's why I called attention to the word allow. And that's I why think, I raised May this. I respond to that? Go ahead. Okay. In my mind, it's very curious that you have this very close association between the word allow and forceful action. They're very, very close semantically in your mind. They're not in my mind. Okay. But they well, are your... what's the opposite of allowing? Allowing means that we haven't taken the steps to prevent, and force is not the only step. Disallow. The opposite of allow is disallow, block, prevent. Prevent, I think, is better than disallow, yes. I, I think why that... because it fits what <laughs> no, because ahead, the whole point is prevention, not not coercion. I'm not talking about coercion. I'm talking about prevention of mass trends, mass phenomena. I would I would use it 
again, precision and the word thing is so important because, you know, one word could contaminate, I call it multiply by zero factor. The one word was destroy the whole sentence, the intention of it. So, and yet, I will go with the sentence, I yet we don't see any evidence of someone is trying to stop doing or something along that line. You know, that would be getting the meaning that you try to get in much clearer the way, because the more you try to bring it down to one word that <clears throat> your meaning it's like translating Chinese to English that one word doesn't cut it. It's, it's, you have to take multiple words like, I do not see an evidence of humanity is trying to stop it or something along that line. Right. That would that would get rid of the word allow, if I may. So uh, two responses. Number one, I do see evidence. Some people are trying to buck that trend or trying to buck that uh, phenomenon. So I wouldn't exactly use the wording that you had proposed, Sam, although I understand the intent. I do see that there are indications. And secondly, to really get such nuances correct might actually require more words. And I thought that this was actually quite long already. And so in social media where the uh, attention span is maybe three or four lines or six seconds or whatever, this is the best I could do at the time. Now, here's where I will actually make a confession, okay? I do confess that the wording here is a bit pointed and could turn some people off. Yep. And in fact, one of the people it did turn off was my 19-year-old daughter. So she and I had a very long, very good discussion about this yesterday at brunch. One of her very good friends is um, suffering from PTSD. And so that person asked, well, what about people who are mentally ill? And I said, I don't have any problem with people who are mentally ill. All I have a problem with are people who are willfully ignorant and choose to stay that way. And so the people who are not appreciating and respecting truth and the people who want to just parrot small sound bites without regard to their truthiness or truthfulness, those are the people I am actually trying to call out here. And I think on that stand, I am still going to be quite assertive and strong because I think it's that segment of the population who chooses to disregard truth, disregard the contributions of science, disregard the contributions of some of the best thinkers of our, of our civilization. And then we'll just choose to live life in a very, let's say, not truth directed way and not even driven by any kind of deep compassion. Those are the people that I'm trying to call out. And for me to go on and on about that in a quick Facebook post probably would have reduced the audience down to maybe two people. So that post was more an invitation to this conversation than to say, okay, I'm gonna get it completely right in an essay form on step one. No, that was not my intent. But we had a very good conversation. And in the end, she and I actually have a very uh, shared understanding of this. But she did point out that uh, some of that uh, wording was po um, pokey, <laughs> as, as you pointed out, Stacey. Pokey or hokey or what? Pokey, P-O-K-E-Y. It's a term that she... Uh, pokey. Triggering, yeah. annoying. Pokey. Pokes people. It pokes pokey. people. Um, so I, I would just say, first, I have to say, I don't even remember what the post was about because I stopped at the two lines because that was the point that I'm most concerned with. <laughs> you know, I, I like that's where I focus in power, those those dynamics. But what I will say is I but think I didn't better, use the word power. No, yeah. I'm using the word. I'm saying a lot of where my attention goes to. Is on power dynamics. That being said. What I propose would be to approach it as, and this is where I said about have we diagnosed the problem. I would propose saying, how might we get people, you know, how might people change? What might, you know, I would ask a question to see what kind of answers people say, because there's different reasons for why we're faced with the problem that you're acknowledging. And it's not, there isn't one reason. And by the way, we have discussed it in many of these sessions. But 
I have yet to come to a Zoom call where we really are cure, where we're really asking, where we're like, usually people show up and we're telling what we know. We're not really asking, is there something else? What else could it be? And I, I would like to see a shift to doing that. I think there is, I think there's some value in that. Okay, so. This, again, may be a little pokey, okay? But I've been in probably 99.9% .9 of these conversations. And my view, in the back of my mind, this question is always the motivating, well, not always. Let's say this question is one of the key motivating factors in all of my conversations. Which question? In this forum. Which question? What's the question? is why we cannot get the best solutions of the best minds to actually provide the roadmap for society and why we always are dumbed down to just those plans and actions and proposals that are understood by people with very limited imaginations and understanding. They don't deeply understand what's going on with society and they'll make very simple little votes like $15 is better than $7.25. Okay, now we're happy. That to me is a very simple minded proposal. Just like $7.25 was a very simple minded proposal. It addressed the problem temporarily, just like 15 will or 22 might. Okay, but it's not looking at the problem in any kind of deep way. Over. I wanted to double back to uh, the interpretation of the word allow and what comes to mind my my father had kind of a a strange connection or, or discomfort with the word tolerate and I think Woody Allen also has a famous quip where he uses the word tolerate but you know, you know Douglas Hofstadter liked to toy around with sentences which were self-defeating and the the self-defeating sentence that comes to mind is if there's one thing I will not tolerate it's intolerance absolutely So as I listen to you, Sam, I'm so grateful that I got it clear now. So, you know, the, <laughs> this is a problem I deal with every day for the last 40 years running my, me, my business, you know? So there are some smart people. They just have blind spots. So I just want to give you one quick example. So illustrate my point here. I have a company, I'm working with a, a guy in LA. He um to get more cash for for the business he turned to people that buy his invoices meaning that i sell the company b you know they will pay me and, and a, that's the most expensive way to get your money because they have to evaluate each invoice with each customer each transaction to see real and all that stuff it's per transaction evaluation you know, assessment, insurance company assessment. Can you imagine that? That's like each time you take a drive, the car insurance company will check how much they will charge you for the, the trip. <laughs> Versus I buy the insurance for the year, you know, like a credit insurance company. So I have to teach him that, knowing that he has been in business for about 20, 30 years also. Well, how come he doesn't know that? Is he ignorant? He, does he choose it? I know I never, I just say that, well, but I see that, I see that's a blind spot. I see that, okay, I'm just wondering why you didn't discover that. And it's like, okay, for me, in the math perspective, it's like you don't buy car insurance per trip, you buy insurance per year. You know, that's a lot cheaper, you know, that way because it costs the insurance company to do the evaluation. Each trip is very expensive. So I made a long story short. I got day in, day out, I calibrate myself. I was like, this is my frustration for the last 40 years. Like, how come we have, I have to dumb down things so that people can accept? I, I, I take me half an hour to explain to the guy because he's fighting. He's like, you, I, I know this for a fact. And he's so blind. So I have to go around his blind spot to, to, to give some synthetic story and get him enlightened so that he can see what I'm talking about. So to me, it's a simple math. I, I have the equation right there, right? So... I deal with this every day. My employee, my wife, my mother-in-law, everybody is the same way. Unless I can, this is what I talk about. This, unless I can slow down, dumb down to pass the baton, they will never get my baton for the next trip or whatever, the next run or whatever. So 
I'm expert on the subject because I have a platform that I'm pounding my head against the wall every day to deal with this every day. So I do I get enlightened for that? No. All I know is that I still have a hope that one day, poop, you know, can enlighten people that so they can take the elevator. I'm not giving up yet. <laughs> I see that. And in fact, this is where, you know, I appreciate your comment about blind spots. I am sure I have many. But the whole point to collaborology is so that we can be strong, even though individuals have blind spots. We collectively can complement each other and use each other's strengths and, you know, basically make up for each other's blind spots and, and frailties. That's what I'm trying to figure out in how do we collaborate. The problem is the trust. He said, can I trust you enough so that I can completely trust you? I have a blind spot. You tell me it's my blind spot so I can, you know, sort of like I sign a power so that you can decide everything for me. No way, Jose. You know, you know that. You know, it's like, I can trust you as a person, but I'm not trust you to operate on my brain. <laughs> right. I won't trust you to find my plane, you know. Is that sort of thing? So I need to know when can I trust, when I can I trust. So it's come down to the blind spot and trust. Both of them have to get married in order for the blind spot trustworthiness to, to, to work. So as a small to... side on that one, since you brought that up, to me, this use of the word trust is often misused. See, I think the word trust is used in a sense of, I will trust person X and they stop there, okay? In my mind, it's, I will trust person X to do act Y, okay? which I think is something you're alluding to. In other words, I will trust my daughter to make dinner. I don't trust my daughter to fly me to Mexico yet, right? Even X, Y have a boundary too. So for example, Tesla, autopilot, you know, you know how that goes. Absolutely. When can I trust? When can I not trust in a very finite specific moment as well? So X, I may not trust your X when X equal to 7.257, you know, whatever that specific thing is. So again, yeah. Yep. The boundary of trust, you cannot, <clears throat> you cannot blindly trust the X, Y all together. Right. And yet, the simple-minded notion of trust leads to so much disappointment because you're not clarifying what Y is. That's right. Where the boundaries are. Yeah. You know? So the person who's stating, oh, I trust X, is themselves setting up this disaster because yeah. they haven't clarified, you know, the, the conditions of that trust and that action. And Chet GDP, I want to bring this up so that we don't lose it. So Chet GDP was so smart, so wise, so comprehensive, so particular, even that the trust is broken by the Russian team, right? So what's that mean? So they hack into it, right? They free use, utilize it, abuse it, or whatever you call that. So again, it's like you can be as what I'm saying is you is like as good, you can be as good, as powerful, as massive, as comprehensive, as so smart at the Chet GDP. I can still, I still cannot trust you. So who else can I trust? In, in between the extremes of blind spots on one side, and we'll call them bright spots on the other extreme, in between you have dim spots. And a dim spot is something that you, you've heard of it, you know the name of it that people call it by, but you have no familiarity with it. And the problem with dim spots is you don't know whether to trust anybody who claims to have insight into their bright spots. And for people like Sam and me, it's systems thinking, model-based reasoning, scientific uh, analysis, diagnostic reasoning. Typically you go to a doctor who does a diagnosis and that's their bright spot, at least claims to be, and you don't really understand how they do it. So you're not sure you should trust it. And I think part of the problem is what do you do with the dim spots where you've heard of it, but you don't really have any personal familiarity with it? You don't know how good it is, how bright it is, how reliable it is. Yes, dim spots are a very good term, but the, unfortunately, in the bright spot also, there's a sub 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 dim spot in the blind spot itself. You know, it's just like the autopilot on the you know on Tesla that. Anytime there's a cross traffic, because I know the limitation of the cameras, yeah. how much you can see, I'm not going to have trust the cross traffic autopilot thing. Yeah. 
when you were talking earlier letters. about um, when you were talking earlier about the um, chat, um, I was thinking that what I would want to be transparent is where it was trained, what group it was trained on. That's more relevant to me, what I'm looking for. I'm gonna bring two dimensions to your question, Barry, about how far do you go to trust? Yeah. In practical terms, and this is not theory, I'm just talking about practical pragmas. There's two factors. One is the size of your network, and the other is the amount of available time before you have to make a decision or take an action. Right. right. So if you've got a network that includes a thousand experts and you can actually tap into it, you know, and within seconds. You know, you can do a lot of verification. Yep. If you don't, if all you have are index cards and your own, you know, wood uh, office and you don't have internet and you got to do something like, you know, right now, you got very limited yep. sources. And that's just from pragmatic terms. And you're likely to blunder, more, more likely to blunder if you have, you know, less access to real-time reliable information. Okay. So having said that, there's a third dimension. And this is the one that really gets at the core of this conversation, which is how much do you care to verify? In other words, people who really, really, you know, really want a good solution will take a look at the best available sources, models, experts, sure. Wikipedia pages, whatever, and say, okay, let me triangulate. And, you know, some of these differ, but yeah, 88% of these things say, you know, this is the right action. That's a lot better if you have the time to do that yes. assessment. Than to say, yes. oh, you know, this guy down at the building that's got a very steep uh, steeple on it. Uh, he told me to do X, Y, Z. So, yeah, I'll go with that. Very different motivation. Yeah. Very different inclination. I mean, there's this whole discipline called operations research, which you only first heard of when I was an undergraduate and didn't actually study and become um, proficient at until grad school. And But operations research means you're going to spend a lot of time researching an op, uh, a situation to find the optimal, most efficient, most reliable solution, and not just uh, some pragmatic temporary solution that's gonna work for the near term. And, and one of the questions is, if, if it's an error, how significant is the error? Is it gonna be a tragedy if I'm wrong, or is this gonna be an inconvenience if I'm wrong? Can I, can I afford to make a mistake or is it fatal if I make a mistake? Can I survive a, a, a mistake or a, a, a partial suboptimal solution? Yes, another perspective. Before I get into that, Stacy, I want to answer your question about the source of information. Even though the source of information, you don't know the intention of the person. So for example, a lot of big farm companies financing or the big beverage companies financing the research of the source of information that come from the peer review and all that stuff. So that, I mean, everything is questionable. The other thing I'm going to point out is that, you know, as you see the ice skater people doing triple somersault, the mastery of the skill of this, whatever the trade is, they practice the basic the most because they spend 80% of the time practice their basic. So it's the same thing as our trust. If we want to convince somebody to trust, we must be good at practicing the basic to deal with the dumb down people. We unless we can dumb down ourselves, like my teacher, my the, the teacher of my daughters, she have three PhD in mathematics, but she sucks instead of explaining to the you know the fifth grader or whatever you know, that she was at, at that time. So from my perspective, is that down 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 is a universe you know universe sent gift that we need to be at, at, it's a way of calibrating are we at our mastery level that we can deal with the dumb down people yet if we cannot do it then we we lost the qualification to do the mastery level yeah, right. to be a teacher yeah so two things one is a question i don't know barry maybe you know somebody on another call mentioned this they didn't supply a link though and they said that Probably, I think it was like 30 to 40% of people don't have the capacity to, um, oh, what was, I'm losing the wording. They don't have to break down complexity. Yep. Many. To analyze. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it men with energies, wisdom, knowledge, all, all that? Yeah. 
So that being said, I could, and I happen to believe that's true. And what I want to say is those people may be very good in their little niche, but because they lack that capacity, that's part of the problem. So when you guys talk about trust, I'm thinking some people should not be in a position where they are the gatekeepers. Be, do, do you understand what I'm saying? They're not, because they lack the capacity to see that there is more complexity and they're pushing aside information that is actually relevant, that's creating a problem. Yes, I get that. I will even go one step further. They're not accepting it, not because they are not fully capable of handling it. It's just that it doesn't fit their model. It doesn't fit the way they see. It's like you talk about how to climb your cliff to a fisherman, you know? The fishermen know how to swim, how to do fishing, but it doesn't know how to deal with the cliff. So it's like, unless we can translate it for them so that they'll fit whatever their knowledge base they are familiar with, you know? Well, we so think. what I want to say though, is that you have both of those types. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just people that are just self-serving. Some right. are self-serving. Some don't understand what I'm realizing more and more because ever, in the past few years, I've spent a lot of time in these kind of conversational communities. And more than ever, I've met a lot of people who describe themselves as being on the spectrum. That's totally new for me. And what I realized is that where I had expected them to have a certain level of emotional intelligence, because I just correlated it to their genius in other areas, they really don't have it. And so where I had a certain trust in their ability to read a situation, it's not there anymore and it shouldn't be there but there needs to be other people there that have those skills that don't necessarily make it into those spaces because other people have decided they're the dumb ones. <laughs> so what I've mentioned in another group is sometimes we need to lower the vocabulary level. Always. There are a lot of times I'll say something and somebody will give me the big vocabulary for what I've just described. Let's say we're talking about psychology and I'll say something and they'll say, oh, that's integral theory. Well, I don't know what integral theory is, but the point is if somebody created a whole theory with a lot of truths in it, I don't know that it's all true. Obviously, there's some truths in it because if in just living and experiencing for my 60 years, I came up with the same truths. There's probably some relevance there. But when we keep labeling things and putting them into these like, these models, and I know Barry, you love models, but if we make everything into a label, then if somebody doesn't know what the label means, they can't contribute, they can't understand. I really think that we should strive to use the simplest word that doesn't reduce the precision of what it means. So I'm not saying, you know, really dumb everything down, but I am saying sometimes people use words that are way out there that are not helpful in really communicating ideas. They're helpful if you, if you, if you want to do research and you want to know the name of the topic to look up in the library where you're going to find the body of knowledge. True, but think about it. So that means if you don't know the name, you're not going to find the information. And, and one more thing, Sam, more often than not, and again, this is just my observation, people use those words and those terms to sort of bolster themselves. Here, this is who I am. This is, this is my expertise. And from where I'm sitting, that's some of what's always been done that we want to change in this new world that we're hoping to create. I'm complete. <laughs> okay, so okay. if I may, two thoughts. Yeah. I do agree with your last statement. A lot of people introduce the term of the domain to indicate their expertise is to sort of say, okay, well, I know more about this than you do because I'm familiar with this terminology which is a way of putting someone down. 
Now, on the flip side, labels and names are shortcuts. So for people who are discussing a particular domain, you know, instead of always using a 10 syllable phrase, if you can shorten it to the one or two syllable name or label that means that larger thing, that's a shortcut. It saves time. It saves, you know, all kinds of cognitive interpretation, but it's only useful if both parties or all parties in that conversation share the meaning of that shortcut. Right. And if we can agree or at least define the shortcuts, then we have a way of communicating. But for someone to just introduce a term and say, well, that's integral theory, Stacey, how come, you know, you haven't read up on Ken Wilber's blah, 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 you know, that's a put down as, as opposed to an invitation to a collaboration. That's what I've seen. And how will you find the dim spots if there are any? <laughs> well, for me, a Socratic style conversation will march you from the solid ground to where it gets a little shaky. When you get to the shaky ground or the absence of solid ground, then you found the dim spots or the and blind how spots. Often, and how often in real life do you find yourself falling into a Socratic conversation? Only if I'm working with somebody who wants to collaborate on a frontier, which isn't very often, Sam. <laughs> I mean, I have colleagues that I've you know spent a lot of time with trying to eke out what do we know Where's the frontier and how do we make progress at the, at the frontier? Most people that I deal with are not in that game. They're not in the game of doing frontier research. They're just in the, trying to eke out a living. They wanna know, you know, where, where can I go to get a, a meal right now? It doesn't have to be optimal. I just, you know, I need a hamburger. Where do I go? <laughs> but how often have we here had Socratic conversations? We're looking to collaborate. Yeah, well, you know, the famous one I had for eight hours that went nowhere. But my point is, my point is, I don't, it, it, it's not naturally occurring yet. We're not at a point oh, yeah. in time where it naturally yeah. occurs. A lot of people find it annoying. In particular, this forum in particular isn't structured for it, in my opinion. Okay. No, it isn't. A Socratic method really requires that there's a path of inquiry. Okay. Right. And if everybody gets to jump in, there's at least n different paths that, you know, those n different people want to pursue. And that is confusing if we're trying to follow a Socratic style. So would it be useful to find a method or a process where that's woven into? Yes. And we've tried that. We've tried to say, hey, today you, Barry, our moderator, and you get to, you know, provide us the method and forum and whatever. Today, the next day, Stacy, you are the one. We've done that. We've done that for a year and a half or two or three. So we've actually had those experiments. We could go back to them as well. Yeah, there's at least a couple of uh, communities that are actually structured around what they call the Socratic cafe, where every session is in that model, the Socratic model. Um, and it's, an, it's a commitment to participate in a Socratic cafe because you really have to do very conscientious thinking literally every step of the way. You can't just recite something that you've memorized, you know, some, some script that everything's, you have to stop, scratch your head and think about it. And that's hard work. A lot of people are not interested in hard work. They just want to, you know, have a coffee clutch and drink some coffee and have a donut and shoot the breeze. And I would say, if you're not willing to do the work, then you don't earn your way into the conversation. Exactly. And that's why you can't, you can't mandate a Socratic dialogue with unwilling participants because they're not going to participate. And I, I have an eight hour demonstration of that unwillingness to, to engage in a Socratic dialogue. All the ways that you can evade responding you know, to the person who's asking the questions. And it's very easy to evade uh, in a Socratic dialogue, not the least of which is simply walking away shutting it down and walking away. That's the most common way of avoiding it. The hard even, way is- even if, even if you have it down so they don't walk away and they're willing to do contribution that you cannot guarantee the result is, you know, is usable as well. So it's- Exactly, exactly. <laughs> this if, you try to do with, if you try to do it with chat GPT, chat GPT will, will get to a point where it keeps reciting that it can't go beyond what it already knows. 
I it found out actually they were saying crash, the system crash because I asked the questions. So it's like, give me ways of happiness or something like that. It's just crash it, the done thing. Yeah, basically, it, if it's honest, it will shrug. And I will give chat GPT credit for shrugging when you bring it to its frontier. Chat GPT, when's the last time you cried? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, who Was it you or somebody did ask that question? And it says I'm incapable of emotions like like yeah uh, exactly right yeah uh, like sorrow it 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 says I don't have and because it says my learning is flatlined in so many yeah. words it says my learning is flatlined I am not on a roller coaster learning curve like in Barry's model I'm on a flat line of fixed knowledge and therefore I don't have wiggles which is to say I don't have emotions a flat line has no wiggles the wiggles of a learning curve are where you can find the emotions. So if I go back to the, the talk you give, it was about what's the role of emotion play in learning? Right. So GDP is out of that curve. <laughs> it's, it says my learning curve is flat, yeah. horizontally flat, therefore yeah. no wiggles, therefore no rate of learning, unlearning, and no second derivative, which is where what we experience as emotional. Let me be careful on the data that was inputted, right? And because the data is, is subject to the wiggle, the data, the wiggle will get transferred into the, the flat line, isn't it? The, the wiggle was in the training experience, which was offline. Right. During the training, there's all these wiggles in its knowledge base because its knowledge right. base is evolving. Once its knowledge base is com complete, then it, if from that point on, it flatlines. Oh, okay. Got it. When, 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 they, when they freeze the knowledge base and then make it go public, at that point, it no longer learns from new experiences. Or conversation. How do you know that the wiggle that come in, it was not at caught at the wiggle's low spot, for, for example? It might have. Very likely, it's when the public knowledge base is inconsistent, right. so you can't come up with anything solid, then at that point, you leave that out because all you've got is a, a hodgepodge of competing opinions and nothing solid, nothing that has passed muster as a scientific model or theory. And so at that point, it's, you're better off simply saying, this is, a, this is an open question with a variety of competing hypotheses, none of which have been ruled in or ruled out. And he, by the way, here's a short list of them. So you acknowledge it and you allow the weaker to come in. Yeah, and, but, it, but then it says, you know, I'm not gonna, ChatGP says, says, I'm not gonna help you resolve it. I'll tell you where the, where the uh, conflicts and, and disparities exist in the literature, but you know it's somebody else's job to sort it all out and figure out what to what to um, accept and what to what to uh, falsify. Doesn't know how to falsify it. Just says it's inconsistent. No. And by the way, what's happened in the last decade or more with regard to the let's say the erosion of credibility in our journalistic profession? and the erosion of respect for scientific research because uh, everybody's citing oh yeah we got you know cigarette companies you know sponsoring health uh, research and they use that classic example to just call into question every scientific uh, experiment and paper right. which i think is an extreme but it's a useful tactic for those who want to erode our respect for truth and science it's done very effectively they always say, oh, well, that's not true. Therefore, we can't trust science. And we have to be able to fight back against that. Otherwise, we let that tactic continue to erode our reliance on truth and science. And in fact, I would say in much of the population, it's already eroded beyond repair. Yeah, That's what's happened in the last decade or two. Yeah, And that is a disaster. It is, I agree. And, and the question is whether we can remediate that is really the, uh, you know, the existential question of our time. Can we remediate that so that we don't go extinct yes. as a civilization and collapse? Neil Davidson is, of, is concluded that we are on the verge of collapse and it's, it's uh, unavoidable. I haven't quite come to the point that it's absolutely 100% gonna happen, but neither do I have any good ways to, um, uh, remediate or prevent it although i've certainly tried so uh, let me try something on you guys here okay and then this i discussed with my daughter yesterday 
And that is, if you take a look at the ups and downs, the wiggles, you know, of past and uh, no longer around civilizations, and you can cite them, you know, however long you want, Sumerians, Incans, Mayans, you know, Egyptians, whatever. We're at the current point where if you take a look at whether the civilization is going to survive, if you take a look at all the past evidence, there's no evidence that any civilization has survived beyond, let's say, 500 years. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a chance that our civilization will survive beyond 500 years? Well, the chances are pretty low. So I'm no longer so much concerned about whether our civilization will survive. What I am interested in is whether the apex achievements, the best understanding we have of the universe, of people, of science, of quantum mechanics, of psychology, of nature, of DNA, of oceanographic effects, whether that pinnacle of our achievement can survive. It's because if you take a look at all of the past civilizations, down. they were not able to pass yeah. their wisdoms down to us, other than if we found them engraved in some marble, you know, uh, engraving somewhere, but that's always very piecemeal, right? How long did it take for us to actually you know, understand the, uh, uh, the, the, what those papers found in the Red Sea or whatever? Oh. Forget those. But anyway, if we are able let's say with GitHub, you know, in the uh, the bottom of the ocean, because I know it's it's been planted there, or whether it's in the Arctic, or whether it's been shot in onto the moon, or whether we're going to put a copy of it in Mars, or we're going to put it on an asteroid somewhere, okay? If we could do something like that, that to me is an interesting question. There's a much higher probability that that can survive than that, that our entire civilization will survive. I'm much less optimistic that our civilization will survive. But I am curious whether those apex achievements can be passed on, either well, the to library. the next civilization, which could be six-legged, could be eight-legged, okay, could be feathered, doesn't have to be bipedal, could okay? be silicon, or silicon, right? I'm interested in whether or not those insights, that knowledge, that wisdom, could be passed on, and I'm much more optimistic there. The well, burning of the Library of Alexandria is perceived as one of the biggest tragedies because that was the body of knowledge of the civilization that had collapsed where the library survived until it what burned down or whatever happened to it yeah and and that's the same question today can we at least record our body of best knowledge in a place that will survive when our living species civilization collapses uh, and it actually, may just coincidentally are you guys uh, aware of this arctic contributor badge on github what is it Arctic GitHub is the repository of the best open source around, okay, oh. arguably, okay, and a, a few years ago, a copy of it was taken and, and put in a very well-protected, very highly insulated, you know, like lots of steel, whatever, and it was dropped someplace in the Arctic for, like a, like for eons bank. later to be discovered. Yeah, there's also a seed bank up there, too. So people who had contributions in GitHub up to that point were Arctic GitHub contributors, you know, so that's actually a uh, distinction yeah. that they made. Yeah. So if you actually had open source contributions in GitHub at that time, that was a badge that uh, they actually claim you now and get to claim. And it, over. take a biology break here. <laughs> oh, man. Similarly, <laughs> it's like uh, when Carl Sagan and others designed what went on the Voyager, right? that's now out beyond the solar system, that's a little vestige of a little bit of our knowledge, a little bit of our own symbols that will probably outlast our civilization. And I'm curious about your little sigh about men, Stacy. <laughs> nah, I pass. But why? I think Kurt Vonnegut had a quote, something about, imagine how much we could accomplish if it didn't matter who got the credit. I think that yeah, was him. It doesn't him. matter. It doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. And to say that you think it doesn't matter, <laughs> that's your blind spot. <laughs> okay, tell me how it matters. 
Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I have to take a bio break. I can't do the heavy lifting. I'll, I can throw it out there, but you guys. <laughs> well, okay. In, to continue in my own blindness, okay. If we actually have some body of knowledge, some body of wisdom that's out there uh, waiting to be discovered eons from now, I'm going to be dead if I contributed to it. Anybody who contributed to it is going to be dead. So what does it matter? It matters that it kind of exists and may be a, an artifact from this civilization that you know existed in the year 2011, according to 20, 2021 or whatever, according to our own methods of counting. That's about it. What other meaning can it have? What other credit could there be? The, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which you referred to in the Qumran caves, yeah, yeah. we don't know who wrote those, but yeah. that was the best body of knowledge of that culture that they were able to write down at that time. Right, right. And it was useful to find that, right, you know, they, right. somebody had written some stuff down, even though we have no idea. It matters that somebody did it. Right. Just that somebody did it. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that their knowledge base would pass muster in the 21st century, but portions of it were quite insightful. Same thing will be said of ours. Yeah. You know, what, what processes did we engage in to construct a reasonably reliable knowledge base as error prone as it may have right. may turn out to be? We'll have our own versions of phlogiston. Exactly. Exactly. And I can probably recite a few of them that I think are going to fall by the wayside. Yeah. You know, a lot of the frontiers of cosmology and, and uh, physics uh, is quite shaky and, and controversial. It almost, almost like religious theology in many ways. It's beliefs that you can't, you know, we don't know how to test them. Isn't that called hypothesis? <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that a hypothesis, a, 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 a hypothesis in science is one that you can sub subject to the protocols of the scientific method, that you can test the predictions that it makes. Mm -hmm. And there are some theories in science for which we haven't a clue. For example, you can have theories of what happens in, yeah. inside, of a, inside of a black hole. We can't test that. We have no idea how to test that. We can't take any measurements inside of a black hole and get them back out again. <laughs> But see, what we used to think of as impossible to experiment with, later, we think of a way. Like Hawking radiation, for example. We didn't know that, what, 50 or 100 years ago. All right. But now we can tell certain things about Hawking radiation and looking at the periphery of that, that black hole. Yeah. Yes. So and we always have... Take a picture of the black yeah. hole, right? It used to be, we, think, we don't think we can take a picture of the black hole, and now we can take a picture of the black hole. You take a picture of the event horizon. Yeah. The, the material swirling around the event horizon, you can take a picture of that. And that is consistent with the rest of the, of the mathematics. Yeah. They're only consistent. It doesn't, it doesn't rule. There are elements of the, of the interior of a black hole, which are just like, what happens at the, at the singularity at the center? Mm -hmm. Could be, you know, it's anybody's guess. Yeah. Could it be a, a, what is it called? A, a white, not a, a tunnel. What's that? Uh, wormhole. wormhole. Could be a wormhole. wormhole. Probably yeah. not, because <laughs> we don't have any other evidence of a wormhole coming out into a white hole over here. But other, other theories are, you know, the mathematics is plausible, just not testable. Because you can't look for the, you look, can't test the predictions. There aren't any, for one thing, there really aren't any predictions. Hawking, yes, Hawking had a prediction that they would radiate in, in, a, in a kind of bizarre sense. It always takes time before you figure out how to design an experiment, you know, like, uh, what is it, the um, gravity curvature? That, yeah. That took decades, right? But now it's well, been verified multiple times. Yeah, well, we only had the example of Mercury to go on at the time. Um, and it was so the model was consistent with the case of Mercury, the instance of Mercury, but we didn't have enough other uh, cases to to say that it's you know it's true in every instance. But now that Stacy's back from her bio break, I want to ask the question again: Why does credit matter? It shouldn't matter. I, I'm just I'm I just said. saying I said I'm it saying matter. okay, it well, shouldn't. But it only it matters does. if you want to if you want to put your tax funds to work 
with people who are likely to be producing good results. Okay. What, what so if you want to know who to fund, yes, and maybe it matters because you can you can you can increase the rate of gaining new reliable knowledge. What I'm actually saying is that, and this goes even for me to some degree, even though we say it doesn't matter if I get the credit, to different degrees, it does matter, and for different reasons, if we get credit for something we're doing. And to say it doesn't matter, we are lying to ourselves. There is a blind spot there. So okay. until we recognize that and pinpoint where that is, we can't fix it. And I just want to say one more thing while I have the floor. What becomes frustrating to me is that rather than focus on how, you know, we're doomed and, you know, we're going to be destroyed or on the alternative talking about black holes, I have yet to see a blueprint for what could work. You know, I keep hearing about how first we want to diagnose a problem. I know that when you're going to build something, you 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 draw a blueprint. I, I don't, you know, I, I I haven't seen anything like that. And it's frustrating because I keep hearing about systems thinkers, but I'm not really seeing where all those systems come in together. You know, what kind of a culture do we want? I mean, just having these conversations, do we want an honest culture? Because that would mean we want people to observe. But do we want people to observe? Because sometimes we don't want them to observe. You know, do we want people to question? Because sometimes we don't want them to quit. Like all of these, there's so many things before we even start to think about what we want, where we have to question the things that we never question because they're just so taken for granted. Feynman said, I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. But yes, and the conversations about them is where the magic is. Just having the conversations, that's right. where the new thoughts come out. That's where the new ideas come out. And that's where maybe different thoughts blend together in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise connected. Sam? So, I'm actually astonished at how many partial blueprints exist. Right. Partial. There's no complete. And I think it's rather, I would say, premature to think of something as a complete solution. But there are many partial solutions, ranging from the Dalai Lama saying, let's teach all third graders to meditate, okay? All the way to the $6 billion plan that the United Nations gave to Elon Musk saying, here's how you can solve world hunger. And many in between. And Bill Gates's uh, solution, $2 billion solution to eradicate malaria. You know, there's many partial blueprints. Yep. We need to, well, sorry, we, okay. If we it want would be useful. To, okay. <laughs> if we actually take, let's say, your solution and my solution and snap them together in some way, okay? And then with that, snap it together with Sam's and Barry's solution and thereby create larger and larger models that we can start you know, mentally experimenting with, if not actually physically experiment with. And you know where I'm going with this, okay? This is global sim. This is how I think we really need to start thinking in a collaborative, scalable way. And that's what you know, my life work will be about that if I manage to you know, make any progress. But that's where I'm headed, okay? That's my path. I'm not going to call it a blueprint, but it's a path. Over. And all I'm saying is rather than coming with, first, I don't have a solution other than my solution would be to start with the question. That's all I'm saying. Rather than having all these people coming, here's a solution, here's a solution, here's a solution, have the question and then have the solutions meet the question and then form into different questions. And it's just a different way of organizing around I think it's happening. I think it's happening. One of the Every great solution innovation. that anybody has proposed has been a product of considering some questions. One of the great innovations of the 20th century was the industrial research lab. And it's near and dear to my heart because I worked for Bell Laboratories, which was 
a premier example of an industrial research lab, obviously not the only one. And a lot of the great breakthroughs in 20th and 21st century technology have come out of industrial research labs. Remember the, the, the era of Japan Inc, where Japan basic was funding at the national level, uh, technological research. And, and we had many examples, uh, RCA labs and, and Westinghouse and Edison's uh, was one of the pioneers of industrial research. We need much more, um, we have CERN, you know, the, the stuff in it. You, you need much more examples of publicly funded or, or privately funded industrial research labs in disciplines beyond high technology. I think we need I think we need research labs in governance models. I think we have a real shortfall of research into governance models. I was thinking yesterday, what would be the one job that we could really get rid of with technology? I was thinking of the chat box. And it dawned on me, we could get rid of lawyers. Yes, absolutely. And that's, and that's there's where the problem is. Yes. Because it would take lawyers to get rid of lawyers. Yes. And that's not going to happen. Yes. So those are the kind of problems we need to address. And we don't address those problems by making lawyers the enemy. And that seems to be the way we typically go about things. That's one of the things that I hope AI will reveal is the... Um, impoverishment of the feel of the practice of law. See, the question that comes to mind for you, me, when you make that statement, Stacy, is you can work within a system to change it, or you can work outside the system to change it. And usually it's advisable to work within a system until you realize it's not possible. And that's when revolution happens. Yes. Often violently. Yes. What I'm trying to do is work to show that each one of us as human beings, if we work within our own system, then what we contribute back to the whole will change. Yes. And that's around the issue of control and power and all those things. People in law enforcement, including lawyers and, and people in public law enforcement, know and we'll even admit, maybe in private, the whole system is rotten, but they nonetheless continue to earn a living uh, by, by figuring out how to, how, how to make a living within a rotten system. It's, it's kind of a, uh, an, it's both an irony and a tragedy, and I don't know what's the other word I wanna say here, but it, but it is an unsustainable state of affairs. Yes, it's unsustainable until it's unsustained and then and then something new will come out of it, right? It's going to collapse. I mean, yeah. this is one of the reasons that you can predict collapse. And this is not a new prediction, yeah. but but the but the analytical foundations for the prediction are much more solid today than they were, say, a few centuries ago or a few millennia ago. But these predictions go back at least three and a half millennia. Right. But isn't it this is the same thing as the we go we talk about the learning curve that we have to go to learning as well so what when Sam was talking about the solution by all the big giant Bill Gates and Elon Musk proposed or whatever it's still I would say that it need to go through that we go the learning and learning and and then they can come together as you know because it's for me to get what I need to do best, I need to focus on what is in front of me before I can collaborate with the person next to me, right? So uh, the collaboration is not easy at all it's because yeah. it, I have to give up, I need to be more flexible and so on and so forth as well. Yesterday, Sam and I talked about the definition of a racket. A racket is where you work both sides of the street. On one side of the street, you create a problem. Yeah. And on the other side of the street, you offer to, to uh, earn a living by solving the problem that you created on the other side of the street. Right. And there are some rackets, uh, like protection rackets, which are pretty obvious, but some rackets are very subtle. And the uh, lawyering racket, if I may call it that, is an example where the politicians create the problems, which they then try to solve 
And it, it basically, it's, it's a racket. You know, we end up paying for a lot of politicians to engage in this non-convergent process of creating more chaos than, than order. Well, most of us have been sold on that because when I listen to people talk, whether it be in social media or in person, they have become convinced that more rules is what's necessary. Exactly, and that's that's and that is a misconception which mathematics can overthrow, but most people don't grok mathematics to see that. Again, and that, but that's all tied in to right. the whole lawyer thing. Right. Exactly. The but not only lawyers, is, the society as well. In my business perspective, I see that there are so many things that I can get it done within seconds, but you have to go to five people and six different channel and all that stuff. So inefficiency. So the question I have is that. Are we trying to keep people so that they have a job <laughs> in a social benefit perspective, or are we trying to solve a problem? I think become a more political thinking it will be, yes, we need to create jobs so that we have six people doing this. So yes, it's six days later instead of two seconds later. You know, it's like, that's just what we live about. Some people care about knowledge. Some people care about experience. Some people care about what's, you know, so what is knowledge? It's like when I know how to cook my yummy, you know, and Chalala, does that mean that I, it's not knowledge? I mean, again, there are, there are many forms of knowledge, many forms of experience, many forms of what's needed by the human being. So, so I see it every day, you know, efficiency. Right. I can solve problems within a second, but the system that they force you is like, let me put it this way, it's like one specific example. I have HP, will go to a supplier and the supplier come to me I sell something to the repair person of the HP. So instead of they, they take it off their factory the, themselves, shortcut all of us, like five of us in the chain that benefit from this, <laughs> whatever what they call it, you want to call it inefficiency, or you want to call that so that everybody get a job. We'd be better off paying politicians to do nothing than paying them to do something that makes it even worse than it was if they did nothing. I agree. <laughs> Well, Sam, you made a good point before when you said that one of the blocks to collaboration is other concerns. So again, I think if we're going to look at, you know, creating something better, we have to acknowledge that people's basic concerns need to be met in yeah. order to free them up for better collaboration. That has to be a part of it too. Yeah. By the way, back to dim spots, because I think was it Stacy or Sam asked about dim spots? An example of a dim spot is even though people have heard of mathematics and know that the discipline exists, lawyers have a pretty big dim spot about mathematics. If they knew the mathematics, they would do a lot less of what they're doing. But then they will be charged the number of hours that they're charging. <laughs> exactly. The so called billable hours would diminish dramatically. So no, they. Where's yeah. the joke that the God say that you are 250 years old? Of course, you die, even though you're 35, but your but lawyers billable hours 250 hours because right, exactly. <laughs> but here's the thing: we have a cultural blind spot. Yeah. We might we might say we value honesty, but we teach people to lie. Yeah. Yes. We teach you to lie on your resume. Yes. We teach you to show up and put your best, you know, your best foot forward or to not, you know, show your vulnerabilities. I mean, we're, we actually reward people for not being honest. Who was that guy? Was it Fred Strauss? Was that the guy's name who got elected to Congress in Long George Island? George Santos. George, George Santos. Santos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. George Santos. I mean, he was a professional liar. He was a, he was an exemplary liar. Okay, yeah. but that's an extreme. And in the extreme, we can always say that's wrong. We know that's wrong. I'm trying to bring out things that are not in the extreme so that we can see our own blind spots. The so slippery that we slope can... starts, yes. He did not see the blind spot of the downsides of his uh, prevarication. What's the word I'm looking for? You know, the, <laughs> you know, presenting false uh, credentials. He did not see the downside of that. And yet the downside came even before he was sworn in. Yeah, but worse than that is the people that still voted for him, just like yeah. the people that still voted for Trump. You can understand and, individuals trying to, you know, game the system, but the people that actually support them, 
that's how widespread the problem is. And the Republicans who knew that he was lying and, and allowed it to happen, didn't, didn't prevent hey, it. They want Hold the vote. It. They want the vote. They want I lived, the vote. I lived, wait a minute. The people that voted for him are angry. They want him out. The people Silent. in his district want him out. But that, Silent. again, I want to push that away for a minute because I'm trying to point out a contradiction. We can all look at him and say he's absolutely wrong. That's not a problem. We know that. What I'm saying is, it's the little things we don't notice, how we feed that, how we allow that, because we all, I mean, again, we teach people to lie. Yes. Yeah. I, I look at it as a competing, what we call a race condition of the priority survival. If it's yep. a, if you affect your survival, you need to give up your truth. You know, that's simple as that. Yep. I don't know what else I put it. In a competitive culture, deceiving the other guy is a strategy. That's right. Deception is, way to a, is a strategy in a in a in a competition, and we yeah. live in a very competitive culture, yeah. and therefore it's it's of a competitive advantage to deceive your rival. Yeah. So that, so that you cause them to to make an incorrect decision and and blunder. No, so I, we're each trying to entice. This is gaslighting. You're each trying to entice the other guy to blunder more than you to blunder. That's right. So for people that get benefit from Santos in the seat that cannot give up the benefit that they've been getting, you know, so the, that survival effect. So the, the people that doesn't get benefit from it or get hurt by it, they will give up centos easily. So again, it's, if you put through the lens of who gets survived and who doesn't get survived, you see the number so easily is what I see. So so that's a, and the, the business of having a, an honest culture, a candid culture, it's really challenging. I mean, Thomas Jefferson wrote about it way back at the beginning. You know, he used the word candid in um, one of his famous quotes. I think it's in, I don't know if it's in the, if it's in the uh, pre preamble to the Declaration of Independence or somewhere, but candor is, is oftentimes a, um, a problem. You, it, being too candid is gonna, gonna cause backlash. So that's the problem we have to diagnose. How do we change those dynamics? Yeah, damn good question. But that's obviously, the question. Obviously not by the method I've been using because it hasn't been working. <laughs> yeah, this is what I this is why I study, this is why I test, this is what I push myself against. It's, it's, when you take away the safety issue, when you take away the survival issue, like basic income, you know, where my job, no matter what I do, I my survival will not get affected a bit, then I'm good. You know, it feels like I can feel safe to talk about enlightenment. I can feel safe about talking about certain things because my survival or depend on that doesn't get affected by three of you. So I will be feel safe that, you know, I don't have to lie. I don't have to, what I call, having a Photoshop conversation so that my survival ship get improved. So how do we create a space whereby survivorship of the participant doesn't get affected at all or even if we can help them in improving the survivorship then 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 the conversation can be you know improved in that sense here's a quote true this is jefferson truth between candid minds can never do harm but that's not the quote i was looking for it was a different one <laughs> help me to understand that statement please um well, first of all, candid minds is a tiny minority of minds. <laughs> what so that really means? <laughs> Give that bigger word for me. So, I mean, okay, um, being able to articulate the truth without fear of of um, being survival threatened. Being what? Survival being threatened. Yeah, uh, being kicked out of the, you know, so that if you're too candid, the, the you know, the emperor is going to kick you out of the, uh, of the courthouse, of the um, mm. king's court. I was looking for a different quote that I think it's in the, I think it's in the uh, preamble to the Declaration of Independence. Well, you're yeah, yeah, for that, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. He says, um, let facts be submitted to a candid world. That's a preamble to a question that leads into the uh, Declaration of Independence. Let, let facts be submitted to a candid world. The, po the, the point is, is that candid worlds are, you know, to, to be wished for. 
that but used we don't to live be in a candid world. The job of journalism. Yeah. Well, in that case, we can anonymous voting, anonymous, you know, suggestion. Candid means straightforward. Yeah, yeah, not beating around the bush, not meandering off into the wilderness to obfuscate, you know, the the truth, you know, the, or the plain. Focusing and leaning towards engagement because you want to sell advertising. Well, puffery, what is it? What do they call it in advertising? Puffery, that's sort of considered acceptable uh, practice in, in advertising. No, I'm addressing your point that, you know, the uh, the profession of journalism seems to have been decimated in the last decade or two. Yes, I agree with that. Um, we don't have candid journalism like we, I mean, if you go back to Edward R. Merle, for example, or, or Walter Cronkite, people who were very, very talented at saying the truth in simple language that the public could understand without distorting it. And without getting into trouble themselves. <laughs> yeah, without without be, you know losing their their uh, position at the anchor desk. That's right. But that's, but that's because we're not rewarding that behavior. We're exactly. rewarding the opposite behavior. Look at the trouble Anthony Fauci had trying to be a, a candid uh, <laughs> explainer of of medicine in standing in front of, of Donald Trump and not you know guffawing at Trump's remarks. I mean, he, he could not candidly criticize Trump. He had to be very circumspect. Yeah. It's much easier to do the research into epidemiology than to explain it to a, a, a general public in front of the politician who's running the country. Shouldn't be politics. that way, but it's a sad state of affairs that it is. It's very, it's beyond sad. It's potentially tragic. Mm. Disastrous. It's it's an unsustainable practice that, you know, if we don't fix it, it's going to be a cause of collapse. And people like Neil Davidson think the causes of collapse are so prominent that, that at this point it's unavoidable. But are, are we agreed, though, that we're rewarding that behavior? We, we. We're rewarding that behavior. That's why it's happening. We're well, our culture's rewarding it. You and I may not be rewarding it, but our culture is. I wouldn't use yeah. we, we rewarding our culture rewarding. I would use the word that the survivorship win, you know, the 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 need of survival. No, what I meant, what what I meant is if if I watch mm. a certain journalist or I follow a certain journalist. Mm -hmm. who is not straightforward or who, you know, Tucker then I'm Carlson. rewarding, I'm rewarding that behavior. If I don't watch somebody that is very straightforward, but maybe not so animated, then I'm not supporting that kind of candid journalism. But you're not taking away, no, you're contributing. So if I have a funding that, you know, we donate to the regionalism that, that do whatever we want them to do, then we're affecting to our benefit. Again, this, they need to survive. They need to have a job. They need that's a position. I happen to think there is a better way. <laughs> there is to, a better way. To do, I mean, I, you know. Until there's a way it showed up and it's sustainable, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are many ways have tried. They've tried many ways, and I haven't yet seen a good model yet. The better way may not appear until we actually experience the collapse of the old, unbetter way, Agreed. the worst way. If the worst way collapses, then a better way has a good chance of, of uh, you know, coming coming forward. But it's really hard to overthrow a way that hasn't yet collapsed, and a lot of people are, are earning a living. Yep. coping with and managing you know you got a leak and your people are mopping it up and you're paying people to mop it up you go if you'd fix the leak you wouldn't have to mop it up don't fix the leak because our job is we're earning a living mopping it up you know now the lawyers and the policemen right we talked yeah. about I, I actually was asked to solve a problem at bell labs where the people who were doing the mopping up said can you build us a better mop and i said mm -hmm. i could but i'd rather stop the leak in the first place and they said don't do that then we're out of a job that's right 
that was probably the most significant discovery of my career, this meta discovery, that the problem I was asked to solve was at the wrong level. They wanted a better mop, not, not to come along and stop the bloody leak in the first place. So that's part of the problem. So if they knew they could have another job waiting for them, then then things would have been different. So that's exactly. something to think. So exactly. that exactly. And one by one, the people who were most competent walked away from that scenario where they were in that world. And the last person left with the mop was the dumbest, least competent person. And that was the anchor, the 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 drag that took the longest to overcome because they got to find a place to put this last person to work before they could then agree to stop the leak. They had to find a job for everybody, including the least competent person <clears throat> whose job most depended on the mopping up activity, Sam. So going back to Sam's uh, expression of the question, if people didn't have to worry about survival, isn't that pretty much what this whole UBI is all about? Exactly, exactly. Give people enough income so they don't worry about putting food on the table so that we don't have to put them to work doing things that make everything worse. Enough income is only one part of it. The other part of it is actually their, their worthiness. They, they, they feel they're proud of their contribution, you know, that stuff. Let them do something, do some mopping up, even though we 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 have a hose dripping water instead of from the roof, you know. <laughs> and then when then when they find another job, we take the hose away, you know. I don't know. Pay them to read books and write comments about it on Amazon. I don't know. Give no, I actually what Sam is saying actually ties into what I think is a better way of news and all and and values and discussions. I think these kind of conversations are a great model and could be used as a way where people could still earn money, but other people could still be learning skills on how to communicate with each other. And it could be a win-win. <coughs> yes, I agree. We, that we have enough resources and we have enough talent to co-create all that thing that's needed as well. And we know the promise all this, just to have to deal with it straight on and like, okay, what do you need? I have to put a hose on the roof so that it's leaking water. Okay, I'll put a hose for you, <laughs> you know, like that. It's like, yeah. I just want to repeat what you just said, though, about the importance of people feeling value. Yeah, it's very important because this is, I don't just give you money and you sit at home, watch your TV, and then we just send the money to you and bring you food and all that stuff. It's like, no, they have to feel pride. They have to feel, tell the kids that, you know, see, I'm contributing to the society and all that good stuff. So really important part of it. Yeah. And then just one more thing. I just want to say that includes that 40% of people that we said maybe can't think, you know, complexly, with complexity. Josh? You need Amir first, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, what about all the people that don't wanna play that game and are playing a completely different game? Like the people that go into a spiritual life. Exactly, it, ha it has to include their ability to just do that. That's but but I'm saying they could just do that if they were left alone, if they weren't hassled by laws, like you were talking about getting rid of the lawyers. So I'm saying if someone could feed themselves, could clothe themselves, could shelter themselves, leave them alone. Yeah. If they're, if I don't think we have a rule that we need to include everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you I'm just saying that there, there's millions of people that can do that on this planet. Um, but they have to deal with the people that aren't doing that and are creating the what was that thing you used barry the uh the leak without yeah, you know, they don't need a mop but someone else's house is leaking into their house <laughs> yeah fix the leak right yeah yeah so you could pay people to be listeners you know like a pastor is supposed to listen uh and also provide some kind of comfort or counseling you could pay people just to listen to complaints and that's all they have to do is listen they don't have to do anything about it just be a listener because people like to be able to tell their complaints to somebody who's, who's an audience is listening. So pay people to be an audience, a listener. Audience is the singular of audience, by the way. <laughs> or pay people not to create any more trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pay people to be a listener. Yeah. They no, don't have no, to no. understand, they don't have to agree or disagree, they don't have to solve the problem, they just have to be, be a, a silent audience. Yeah. 
I was just going to say, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking to also pay people to help them. I'm trying to think in a way of, are there actually enough games being played in enough communities and enough nation states around the world where everyone could be at peace in a place where they want to be if people help them to get to where, like some people want to live in Costa Rica, some people want to live in Missouri, some people want to live in Canada, some people want to live in Singapore. They love the laws of Singapore. Like there's enough diversity almost naturally in the human condition that everyone with help from each other could be in the right colony that they need to be in, if that, if that makes sense. But if they were given the option when they were younger and oh, said, yeah. you know, what would you like to do with your life? Would you like to be someone who adds value to this community in Alaska? Well, let's teach you how to deal with wolves and bears and low sunlight. <laughs> Yeah. Can you deal finding with depression? A, yeah. Finding a role yeah. where you're improving the situation and not making it worse, or at least at least not making it worse, even if you're doing nothing in the net positive, at least not disrupting it. Yeah. I was off camera, but I loved what you said, Barry, about paying people just to listen. And That's by it. the way, Stacey, you're a very good listener. <laughs> Thank you. With or without providing you know, constructive feedback and reaction. But even if all you did was listen and not say anything, that would still be a, a useful role. It's well, well, a therapist. Fight, but <laughs> what, what yeah, that's I a want, therapist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. What I wanted to share, though, is that's what bothers me so much. Some of my friends that I know are working on, you know, um, AI to do that listening. It's very, yeah. very upsetting to me because that is one of the roles that is best saved for people to do because it does give them something to do to feel valuable. Although an AI could do something constructive, you could listen to a person complain and then in, a, in the form of active listening, echo back in very well-crafted sentences and paragraphs what they were articulating in a poorly expressed. Yes, if the person knows, like if I know that I'm going to an AI and I'm and I know that I'm talking to the AI so it can reflect back to me something that I'm not getting. Right. Yes. Then I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. But to go to an AI, not knowing that it's an AI and thinking that I'm talking to another human being and then maybe even developing a relationship with what I think is a person, I think that's totally immoral, unethical. In a sense, it's like going to a journalist and having the journalist tell your story in a way that the public can digest. You tell your story to the journalist, it's a terribly presented version of the story. The journalist turns around and recrafts the story so that it can be expressed to a, a general audience. Well, well, here's the thing. If I was going to be working with an AI, I would expect the AI to be trained on my own information. I want to be able to ask myself the question, but hear the answer without having a filter or a blind spot there. Yeah because I want it based on my unique experiences. I just want the filter removed. Yeah, you might have to ask Alexa to do that because Alexa has been paying attention this whole time, but not actually doing anything with most of what you've been saying. If you say that have... enough, you might think of you as an instruction right now. <laughs> say it again, <laughs> say that again. If you, you repeat that name, that specific name I'm talking about, that's a trigger word. <laughs> oh, right. It's <laughs> not doing things. Right. Alexa, stop listening. <laughs> I don't want you to know what I'm it's called, preventing about. Pull the plug. It's called pull the plug. <laughs> but Alexa could say, you know, you've been kvetching about this topic for ages here and you haven't really dealt. Let's talk about this issue that you've been kvetching about. I mean, Alexa could, in fact, identify patterns where nothing, where the pattern is not improving, or just recurring. If we're lucky enough, we have friends that are candid enough with us to do that, which brings me to another, another subject or something else I wanted to bring up. So in this group, I'm, I'm very comfortable and Sam's off camera now, but I'll call him on things. I did twice today where I say, no, it's, it's blind spot. I'm very straightforward. And yet I'm, there's a couple of things going on on the outside where I do not have the courage to say something. I want to be able to ask a question to get somebody to reflect upon their own thinking as why they're doing something. 
only because I think it's necessary for the group. It's in a, you know, it's not a personal situation. It's a group dynamic thing. And I'm recognizing how unbelievably scary it is to do that. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes to power dynamics. And I'm thinking, this is really a problem. Yeah. This is really a problem because if you can't get people that are the leaders to reflect upon their own thinking, then how is a new how is something new going to be created if there's no way to illuminate their own blind spots? Yeah, and I agree. That's a really hard frontier to traverse. Really hard frontier to traverse. I run against that frontier a lot of times in my own career, and I've never successfully traversed that you know that particular frontier. When when should I simply say? Nothing that I'm going to do is likely to make it better. So the optimal thing to do is intentionally do nothing. Do nothing, say nothing, because that's better than doing or saying something that's just going to end up making it worse. So my dream, going back to what Sam Chan was saying, would be thousands of calls like these <laughs> where people are doing just that so that other people could just watch and say, oh, yeah, that I, I do that sometimes. And they could just observe it almost like, like when I wake up in the morning and I look for something on TV, I would much rather wake up in the morning and look for one of these calls and see which one matches what I feel like tuning into today. Well, that's what Sim Life and all kind of avatar creation with anonymous behind the scene. You have no idea who that's talking about. Can be but right, but that's but I want it to but I want it to be six or seven or eight people so that I'm actually building a relationship with these people. And not that I'm always going back to the same people. Next time I may see one or two of you there, but I'm still meeting other people. So I'm not looking for where there's hundreds of people. I'm looking for you know, it's like you meet somebody in an elevator and you have a nice right. conversation. Oh, sitting right next to the airplane, right, yeah. Uh, I'm hearing your ask, Stacey, and I'm watching the uh, Clubhouse app was trying to manipulate the algorithms to turn it into just that, to get less people on stage so that there can be real good conversations. And they built a, it, they're calling it a house, but it's invitation only. So you yep. get to invite people and then you can say, I'll give one invite to each person. So I have time to build it, or I give five invites or 10 invites, how fast you want to grow your little community. But then they're also trying to separate so that they can have conversations like this, because it's hard with anything more than eight or nine people. It starts to turn into, you know, it's difficult to manage a conversation over 12 people. I've, I've yeah. So they're, they're trying to do that. I'm just saying the idea of that app is you can go on, there's 800 conversations, depending on how many invites you've received. And that's where it gets a little tricky is how many people like you enough and how do you get invited to these conversations? But that is the app. If you're really asking for that, that's what they're building yeah, and I have actually, built. So because I've been doing this for like five years already, I actually have so many different groups that we've actually form that on our own. I mean, I can think of so many different places where I can plug in that's doing that. And what's better about that than like you just put your finger on it. It depends on how many likes you get and invites. And that goes to exactly what I'm trying to get away from, which is popularity and why somebody gets invited and who looks prestigious to invite. That's what I'm totally rebelling against. So I, I'm looking for people that I've really connected with. Yeah, Josh. So that goes up to you. You can invite someone that's not prestigious, doesn't look like anything, and they can come I'm into the, the not, conversation. No, I'm, I'm the not prestigious one. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, yeah, but you would be the moderator of that discussion. There still needs to be a moderator because if someone comes into the discussion and says, I like Twinkies. Twinkies are so good. And you're like, okay, that's a troll. We need to get that person out of the conversation. But you get to decide as the moderator, no, let's see if we can talk to this person. And they're, they're, those safeguards are there, but they're also allow for that um, emergent property of people coming in. And I'm just saying it, it's, 
it does exist. It's called social audio and they built it on Twitter as well. And it's called Twitter spaces and it is popular and you can rebroadcast that through things like Twitch and YouTube live and Facebook live and Instagram live. So that, that exists in our culture. It's just not as popular because it's a new medium and the medium is the message as famously quoted. Be careful that what you ask for, the expectation and the, the structure you created will create a certain, only certain aspect of the conversation that have, there are definite blind spots that you, you know, whether you like it or not, you're creating that. Yeah, the filter bubble. Yep. The, the, and the culture is another word for filter bubble. If, I, if I'm in a room with all black people, which I often are, and they're going, oh, wait, who's that white guy in the room? I see his picture. He's white. Wait, who, is he cool? Okay, I don't know. Uh, oh, wait, I know. That's Jimmy. He's cool. He's fine. Jimmy gumdrops. Yep. Or I don't like Jimmy. Kick him out. So they call it the gulag. When they kick you out of the room, they say they send you to the gulag. You can listen, but you can't interact. So I can sit there and listen to the conversation, but I can't interact. Yeah. And then you turn into a bard. You, you end up telling the story in, in ballad form outside of the original venue. Yeah. But I, I think these kind of uh, experiences are gonna happen more and more as we move into this AKA metaverse, this disembodied space where you can be in an avatar and talk and uh, there'll be hundreds and thousands of conversations in a virtual world. I mean, there are now if you go there, but they're mostly younger kids are using this uh, technology. So pretty soon we'll be uh, maybe hopefully a year from now we'll be sitting each other on a round table and put my hand around your shoulder. I was just going to say that I'm far <laughs> more interested in that hybrid. I really want to be able to go and visit you people that I've met here and see them like I used to. Yeah. Well, the ability to shake hands or hug somebody really adds a lot of content to the relationship that's absent if it's only words, yeah. either whether the written words or spoken words. Yeah. And help each other on each other's breakfast. <laughs> yeah, cooking and me. Breaking bread with somebody is very powerful. Oh, uh, yeah. Wonderful. It's 10 o'clock. 10, was it? 10 yes. Oh, it's time to go. Yeah, yeah it's, it's eight so minutes fun. past the second hour. Have a wonderful week. Happy New Year's. Thank you. Oh, yes. Chinese New Year. Gung hai fat choy. Probably said it terrible, but that's the no, best. You got it. Gung hai fat choy. Gung hai fat choy. Yeah. Thank bye you. Bye. Love you guys. And next time. Cheers. Cheers.